You're all very welcome to the Four Courts, the historic centre of the administration of justice in Ireland. And I'm delighted to see so many of you in our round hall this evening, in spite of the extremely wet weather. We gather for a lecture to be delivered by Dr. Miles Dungan, who will speak on the Irish Law Times Goes to War 1914-1918. This public lecture is the second in a series of lectures which is organised by the Court Centenary Commemoration Committee. The committee's aim is to commemorate events which occurred in and around the Four Courts between the decade 1913 to 1923. The committee was established in, 19, uh, in 2013 when Ireland commenced its decade of commemorations. The committee uh, comes from the members come from the judiciary, the court service, the Department of Justice, the Office of Public Works, the Bar Council of Ireland, the Law Society of Ireland, Trinity College, and we are all involved in planning lectures and events uh, in the four courts over the coming years. The committee's focus is not only on lectures commemorating events which have connect are connected to the four courts, but also those events which are associated with the legal profession, law and justice. The committee wishes to do so in an inclusive way, arising from the diversity of Irish history, and we hope that our endeavours will be of interest to those working in the law and to all interested in Irish history. Our island has a rich history which spans the millennia, but we live in a relatively new state. The events of a hundred years ago have a decisive effect on the direction that our island and its people took. We had the labor strike, the World War 1914 to 1918, the 1916 rising, the War of Independence, the Civil War, nation building, and building peace. History, however, also comprises the ordinary lives of people. Private and family lives are marked by these events. And so this evening's lecture will remember Irish lawyers who served in the British Army during World War I. The Law Society and the Bar Council have commemorative plaques in this building honouring those lawyers who perished on the continent. One such lawyer was Thomas Kettle, whose poem to my daughter Betty, The Gift of God, was written to his young child just days before he was killed in 1916, and nearly a hundred years later who would not be moved by his words. So here, while the mad guns curse overhead and tired men sigh, with mud for couch and floor, know that we fools, now with the foolish dead, died not for a flag, nor king, nor emperor, but for a dream born in a herdsman's shed and for the secret scripture of the poor. Over the last hundred years, Irish men and women from every part of Ireland, of every faith and none, were involved in the more public struggles of the Irish people, whether it was labor strikes, civil unrest, war, or nation building. A hundred years on, our nation-building project continues, and the peace we now enjoy, which is protected by the rule of law, requires constant vigilance and care. The onus is on current and future generations to keep working on these tasks and to build an Ireland that is more inclusive and innovative, more peaceful and more prosperous, an island that is kinder and where people are truly free. Let us hope that by commemorating the times of our ancestors, it will remind us that the history of Ireland is a work in progress to which we can all contribute. The words of the philosopher George Centennial have a particular resonance during our decade of commemorations. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Events such as this and those planned for the future allow us the possibility of remembering, learning and understanding with a definite opportunity and challenge not to forget. Ladies and gentlemen, we now, it now gives me very great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Miles Dungan. Dr. Dungan's unmissable voice is known to us all through his career as a broadcaster of current affairs, sport and the arts. He is the presenter of the history show on RTE's Radio 1 and can be heard on RTE's Drive Time programme with his most informative on this day. He is a historian and author of books on 19th century Irish history, the American West, the Great War, and he has also written two plays. Dr. Dungan was awarded a PhD in history in Trinity in 2012. His academic work includes his post as adjunct lecturer at UCD's history of, uh, School of History and Archives, and he's a lecturer at City Colleges Dublin. 
In 2011, he lectured in University of California, Berkeley, where he was a Fulbright Scholar in 2007 and 2011. He's a tutor also of Trinity College in 2009 and 2010. The title of Dr. Duncan's lecture this evening, The Irish Law Times Goes to War, 1914-1918. During the lecture, he will be joined by his friend, uh, Turtle Bunbury, who is a very well-known writer, historian, and broadcaster. We welcome them to the four courts and thank them for their presence here this evening. And we look forward to our journey through the war years from the perspective of the Irish Law Times and Solicitor's Journal as guided by Dr. Duncan. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a great pleasure and a great privilege to be here. And I also want to thank uh, my good friend, Turtle Bunbury. I was dismayed earlier today, but I'm not jealous at all, but I was dismayed when I went into Hodges Figgis to discover his book, The Glorious Madness, is right in the eyeline of the buyer, whereas mine, on a similar subject, is about three shelves further down. So, well done, Turtle. Well, thank you. Um, however, um, and uh, also in anticipation, thank you very much indeed for helping me out with this, with the, uh, with the readings. My intention tonight is to view the four years and the three months of the Great War through the prism of a specialist journal, one that watched over the activities of the legal profession with a loving gaze, the loving gaze of an adoring mother anxious to defend her children against outside interference, but capable of admonishment if the situation arose. The Irish Law Times and Solicitor's Journal, to give it its full title, traced its ancestry back to the Irish Law Times and Reports established in 1865. It was, in 1914, published on a weekly basis. It was uh, also published a comprehensive annual supplement of law reports containing details of significant cases which might have an impact on a legal system based on judicial precedents and judgments. It reporters, or its reporters at the time of the war, included in 1918 a very young John A. Costello, who was covering the King's Bench Court for the periodical. Other contributors included names like J.R. Pierce and Hugh J. McCann. I mention them because clearly they are surnames which uh, seem to have persisted in legal circles to this day. In 1914, it was generally 10 pages long. By 1918, it had been reduced to eight or even six pages given the scarcity of newsprint. So what was the legal landscape like in 1914? Well, there were fewer than 500 barristers as compared with more than 2,000 today. There were fewer than 2,000 solicitors as compared with 10,000 today. The judiciary in 1914 included a total of 14 superior court justices. This included a six-judge court of appeal. Uh, ultimate appeal was still to the House of Lords. The lower courts were the domain of county court judges justices of the peace and resident magistrates. In 1914, there were 6,000 JPs holding court in quarter sessions or petty sessions. Interestingly, 2,400 were Roman Catholic, twice the number uh, of, 19, of 1886. Uh, there were also 64 resident magistrates in 1914, paid by the Crown and expected to be legally expert. The leading judicial lights of the period were the extraordinary Baron Christopher Pallas. This is a, a photograph taken of him at a relatively early age. He'd been the chief baron of the Court of Exchequer since 1874, and he would retain the post until his retirement in 1916 at the age of 85. He died in 1920. One of his judgments was cited as recently as 2006 in an action against a certain national broadcasting station. I will not name them to spare their blushes. At the time of his retirement, his court had already been absorbed into the king's bench, hence his title, the last of the chief barons. Lord Peter O'Brien, the Lord Chief Justice, who was the proprietor of the airfield estate in Dundrum, actually died in 1914, shortly after the outbreak of, of uh, war. Known while a crown prosecutor in the 1880s as Peter the Packer for his renowned ability to pack a jury in favor of the crown. His obituaries in the Irish Law Times are uncontaminated, it has to be said, by any reference to his expertise in this questionable practice. Questionable, that is, if you are a defense attorney. 
the judiciary presided over a system that within a few years would obviously be supplanted by a shadow subversive apparatus of Sinn Féin Supreme Court, District Court and Parish Court, which are the judicial robes, would pay the official system the homage of imitation while ruthlessly seeking to replace it. Times were already uncertain for the members of the bar even before the declaration of war. On the 31st of October 1914, the Law Times noted that the decrease in business to which we called attention last year continues. There were fewer cases before the courts. The total amount allowed in costs had declined from £240,000 to £199,000. Bankruptcy sittings were down from 1,384 in 1912 to 1,188 in 1913. Good news for society at large, but not particularly good news for the legal profession. The first issue of the ILT after the outbreak of war was published on the 8th of August, 1914. Now, despite the tumultuous events of the 3rd and 4th of August, 1914, uh, the focus of the ILT was on matters, uh, let's say, slightly more mundane than murderous global conflict. For example, estate duty on agricultural land in Ireland. Section 63 of the Companies Consolidation Act of 1908, the adjudication of costs in civil cases, and uh, the statute of distributions relating to the division of the residue of a will after provision for the widow, and the results of the annual bar examinations in UCD. This at a time when the world was at war. Uh, for the record, in relation to the bar examinations in UCD, one M. Binchy finished in second place. It's been suggested to me this, this may be Michael Binchy who went on to become a circuit court judge, but the name, as you are well aware, persists in the legal profession to this day in this country. A female candidate, interestingly, Miss May Hogan, received second class honours and was placed 12th, or sorry, 21st. Uh, 12 of these successful candidates were from India. Uh, an interesting footnote. One of the Indian students who studied law in Ireland at UCD, as it happens, during the war period, and whose examination successes were mentioned in the Irish Law Times, was V. V. Giri, a political activist. He went on to join Sinn Féin to befriend Eamon de Valera, and this resulted in his expulsion from the country in 1918. On returning to India, he became a labor activist and a member of the Congress Party. He was imprisoned by the British Raj prior to Indian independence in 1948. In 1969, he became acting president of India before taking on the role in his own right uh, until 1974, during which period Indira Gandhi was prime minister. Uh, a footnote, as I say. By the 15th of August, the Irish Law Times had hit its stride and had woken up to the fact that Ireland was willy-nilly at war. It was now engaged enough in the concerns of a wider world to quote a Law Times editorial on the questionable constitutionality of the appointment of Lord Kitchener as Secretary of State for War. Popular opinion must undoubtedly endorse the action of the Cabinet in putting that all-important department at such a time as this in the capable hands of one whose services and achievement mark him out as essentially the person to deal with the situation so far as our active land forces are concerned. A thumbs up for uh, Kitchener there, but the ILT still devoted space to what the general public would see as trivialities, but which presumably were of no little importance to the legal profession. For example, the right of a junior to carry a brief bag. The ILT pointed out that... In these days, the right of the very newest junior at the bar to provide himself with a brief bag is so unquestioned that it may surprise some members of the profession to learn that this privilege did not always exist. Apparently it had been ordained in 1806 that no man could carry a bag who had not received one from a king's council. However large the junior barrister's business might be, he was forced to carry his papers in his hand. The practice wasn't formally abolished apparently until 1831, though it was moribund long before that. Um, in the issue of the 22nd of August 1914 comes the first 
detailed reference to a piece of legislation that will come to dominate the legal landscape for the duration of the war, the defense of the Realm Act, or DORA, to her good friends, among whom only the Crown prosecutors of the Irish Bar could reasonably be numbered. This was a short and rather vague piece of legislation rushed through Parliament with the intention, according to the ILT, of enabling the authorities to deal summarily with matters of immediate danger. It began as a couple of paragraphs conferring power on the government, but by 1918 the list of regulations was so long as to encompass more than 650 pages, banning, amongst other things, the flying of kites, the practice of treating in public houses, the throwing of rice at weddings on pain of a fine, or in the case of the latter heinous offence, of imprisonment. The first overt reference to the military side of the conflict in the ILT was on the 5th of September 1914, with a helpful article on the wills of soldiers on active service in what must have been quite a sobering experience for the ordinary volunteer, Tommy, the army allocated a page in the soldier's paybook for the writing of a simple will. Soldiers on active service, the ILT pointed out, were exempt from many of the provisions of the 1837 Wills Act. They did not, for example, have to be 21 years of age before they could make a will, and there was no requirement for the document to be witnessed. The ILT opined that, in relaxing the rules of will-making in favor of our soldiers at the front, our law exhibits a wise and just discretion. It was the first recognition by the ILT of the serious and pressing health and safety implications of going to war. These early days of the war, before awareness of the precarious position of the British Expeditionary Force became widespread, have a, a certain air of surreality about them. There's a matter of factness in relation to the immediate consequences of the outbreak of the war, but by and large, it was business as usual for the ILT. Recent legal decisions are published. Advertisements continue to be carried. The death of Lord O'Brien, the Lord Chief Justice, is noted, and his career is discussed, as I've said. The war impinges, but only in a professional sense. The, the air of surreality was reinforced by a piece carried on the 19th of September, in which the reader is informed that a natural feeling of panic, coupled with the fact that alien enemies are forbidden under the new Alien Restrictions Act to own homing pigeons, has led numerous persons in various parts of the country to wage warfare on all carrier pigeons, or pigeons presumed to be such, which cross their range of vision. In various police courts, persons have been summoned and to their surprise find for committing what they considered the patriotic act of shooting such pigeons. All that was required was some simple guidance, like this, for example. <laughs> However, that same week, the war became more personal, as the Irish Law Times noted the trickle soon to become something of a minor exodus of barristers, solicitors, solicitors' apprentices, and the sons of senior legal figures into the armed forces in the wake of Kitchener's call for 100,000 volunteers, a modest beginning as it transpired. The journal noted one significant recruitment gathering in particular in its edition of the, 7th, of the 19th of September. The Irish Bar is well represented in the company formed by volunteers from the Irish Rugby Football Union. Among the contingent who, who went to the Curragh on Wednesday were Mr. Julian, lately Reed Professor, Trinity College, Mr. Poole Hickman, on second treasurer of the Munster Circuit, Mr. Herbert Tierney of the same circuit, and Messrs. Thomas Hughes and Charles Godfrey Place, barristers at law. We convey to them our heartiest good wishes. This was, of course, one of the most celebrated and unfortunate units of the Gallipoli campaign, D Company of the 7th Royal Dublin Fusiliers, the so-called PALS, destroyed on uh, Kirich Tepe Cert in Suvla Bay on the 15th, 16th of August, 1915, barely a week into the second major Entente incursion in the Dardanelles, a unit that would find its chronicler among the members of the bar in the shape of King's Counsel Henry Hanna, of, uh, of whom more later. So, why did so many members of the legal profession join up? 
youthful idealism and a martial tradition were certainly contributory factors. Many barristers were graduates of Trinity College where there was a very active officers training corps, OTC, as there was in Queen's University in Belfast, another major source of entrance to the bar. Many of the members of the bar who were commissioned as officers would have been members of those OTCs. Officers pay uh, a second lieutenant got two pounds, 12 shillings a week, a full lieutenant, three pounds, might also have been attractive to very young barristers starting out, and also the feeling that war service would do their careers no harm when they returned. Later, the Inns of Court Officer Training Corps would send more commissioned officers to the armed forces. Most of the members of the legal profession who joined up had already received commissions. They were officers. They had become officers. There were a couple of notable exceptions. For example, Joseph Bagnall Lee, a Trinity graduate and former auditor of the Law Students Debating Society, who had been called to the bar in 1909. We're uh, joined by his grandson here tonight. He first enlisted as a private in the 6th Royal Munster Fusiliers, but was rapidly commissioned and just as rapidly, unfortunately, killed in action on the 7th of August, 1915, hours after landing at Suvla Bay in Gallipoli. Another exception was the aforementioned Herbert Tierney, who'd been called to the bar in 1910. He joined D Company, 7th Royal Dublin Fusiliers, as a private, but was then commissioned as a second lieutenant in the 8th Cheshires and was killed in the attempt to relieve the obnoxious and arrogant Major General Sir Charles Townsend in 1916 in uh, Mesopotamia, Iraq as it is now, in the siege of Kut el Amara. To describe uh, Townsend as a donkey, as many British generals were, is, as far as I'm concerned, an insult to a fine animal. Despite received wisdom to the contrary, not all the barristers and solicitors who joined up were Protestant and Unionist, though a majority of the politically committed probably were. But there was also a generous sprinkling of nationalists. Uh, Tom Kettle, the Chief Justice, has already mentioned, and William Redmond, of whom more later. William Archer Redmond, like his uncle and his father, a nationalist MP, and Hubert Michael O'Connor of the King's Shropshire Light Infantry, a winner of the Military Cross, killed during Third Ypres, and an independent nationalist candidate in 1910 for East Limerick. Between August 1914 and uh, February 1916, 126 barristers, 110 solicitors, and 71 solicitors' apprentices would enlist a total cohort of 307. In addition, the sons of 160 other barristers and 175 solicitors would also join up. By the end of the war, 25 barristers, 20 solicitors, and 18 apprentices had been killed or were unaccounted for. Among them, Tom Kettle, Ernest Julian, Poole Hickman, and Willie Redmond. This represents an attrition rate of almost 20%. The overall UK attrition rate, and Ireland, as you know, was a member of the UK at that stage, was 12.6%. The overall Irish rate is impossible to establish exactly, but it hovered around 14 or 15%. That attrition rate of 20% reflects the fact that most were junior officers. Junior officers uh, in uh, the Great War had a fatality rate of 19%. Um, you've already heard the Chief Justice refer to this gentleman here, Tom Kettle. Thomas Kettle, the most illustrious, probably, Irish victim of the war, was a barrister, a uh, poet, and an academic. He was the son of one of the founders of the Land League, Andrew Kettle. He had been the auditor of the LNH in UCD, an Irish party MP, and he was professor of national economics at the National University of Ireland. He was also the author of, uh, as the Chief Justice has pointed out, perhaps the best Irish World War I poem, To My Daughter Betty, A Gift From God, written to his small child a couple of days prior to his death at uh, Gashi in Picardy on the Somme in September 1916. The Chief Justice has already rendered the closing quatrain, uh, but uh, I think it's worth hearing again. Know that we fools, now at the foolish dead, died not for flag, nor king, nor emperor, but for a dream born in a herdsman's shed, and for the secret scripture of the poor. In an Irish Law Times obituary, he was described as... A man of brilliant scholarly attainment, who both as a writer and as a speaker, had established a wide reputation, possessing a genial disposition, charm of manner, ready wit, 
and kindness of heart endeared him to all. Although, as we know, it is the Irish practice to speak no ill of the dead, this description of Kettle, leaving aside his known propensity for an overindulgence in alcohol, was probably well-deserved. Ernest Julian, in his mid-30s, originally from County Offaly and a member of the Connacht Bar, uh, was another fatality, became Reed Professor of Law at Trinity College in Dublin in 1909 as a result of a competitive examination. Obviously, famous future appointees included Mary Robinson, Mary McAleese, and Ivana Batchik. He was a lieutenant in the 7th Dublin Fusiliers who died within hours uh, of landing at Suvala Bay, like uh, Joseph Bagnall Lee, in the 1st 10th Division attack on Chocolate Hill, as did Poole Henry Hickman, a member of the Munster Bar. He actually survived Julian by just over a week, dying in the unnecessary carnage of Kirich Tepe Sert on the night of the 15th, 16th of August, 1915. All three were officers in the Dublin Fusiliers. Willie Redmond, brother of John, was at 56, too old to be in the front line, but he insisted on being allowed to join his unit of the Royal Irish Regiment in the successful assault at Messine, on the 7th of June, 1917. Uh, Redmond had been called to the bar in 1891, but obviously he was more of a politician than a barrister. He'd uh, spent his 21st birthday in Kilmainham Jail with Charles Stewart Parnell. In 1917, his age probably told against him. The wound he received was to his arm, but he, he would appears to have died of shock. Almost every week, the Irish Law Times published details of death or injury among members of the legal profession or their offspring. Some of the details are extremely poignant. I've selected just a couple. In consecutive issues, on the 22nd of the 29th of May 1915, the Irish Law Times announced the death of Lieutenant J.S. Martin, 1st Royal Irish Rifles, the only son of R.T. Martin, solicitor of College Gardens in Belfast. He'd been in the sixth form at the famous Uppingham Public School in England, which had sent many students directly into the army. Martin was one of those. He was due to go to Oxford, but he left school as soon as he was commissioned. He reached France on the 15th of March and was killed on the 9th of May, eight weeks on the Western Front, short even by the horrendous standards of life expectancy for junior officers. The following week, it was the turn of W.A. Lipset, who was resident in Canada, but who was late of the Irish Bar. He was killed at Ypres on the night of the 22nd, 23rd of April. According to the ILT, he threw up a good appointment to join the first Canadian contingent traveling to Europe. According to the late Anthony Quinn, in his excellent work, Wigs and Gowns, Irish Barristers in the Great War, Lipset, who was a native of Donegal, was a rarity. He was a private, and he had refused to accept a commission. Other barristers, like Joseph Lee and Herbert Tierney, I've already mentioned, had enlisted as privates, but had rapidly been commissioned. The most obvious and immediate military tragedy for the Irish legal profession was the wretched Gallipoli campaign. On the 28th of August, 1915, the Irish Law Times recorded three dead barristers there. Robert Cullinan, Poole Hickman, and Joseph Lee, with Ernest Julian reported missing. In fact, Julian was already dead. Two solicitors, William Bridge and William Reeves Richards, were also recorded as fatalities. And to this number was later added Herbert Finlater, a solicitor, and two other barristers, John Henry Leland and Gerald Plunkett. The journal published a war supplement in February 1916 containing the names of the 307 barristers, solicitors, and solicitor's apprentices serving in the Crown forces. Of the 20 members of that cohort who had already died up to that point, 10 barristers, 6 solicitors, 4 apprentices, half of the deaths had taken place in Gallipoli. So Gallipoli was particularly uh, costly for the legal profession. One really extremely tragic death was associated with Gallipoli, but did uh, not actually take place, uh, place there. Um, the young and very promising Irish rugby international, Jasper Thomas Brett, the solicitor's apprentice, survived Suvla, but was invalided out of the army in Salonika, which was where the 10th Division went next, suffering from shell shock. After a brief period in hospital in England, having been diagnosed as insane, he was released to his family in Dunleary in January in 1917. The following month, he placed himself on the Dublin to Bray railway line in Dorky Tunnel, 
and allowed the 2210 uh, train to crush and dismember his body in a manner similar to that of the destruction of his mind. Uh, my thanks for bringing this to my attention to uh, Kieran O'Mara, solicitor. Although his name doesn't feature in the Irish National War Memorial record, he is recognized as a war casualty by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Brett had been one of the pals in D Company, 7th Royal Dublin Fusiliers, like many members of that elite but unfortunate group. As I say, he had a legal background. So it was appropriate that one of the most prominent members of the law library should seek to record at least some aspect of that ill-starred Suvla campaign. Henry Hanna, born in Belfast and educated at Queen's University, had become a King's Counsel in 1911. He defended Jim Larkin during the 1913 lockout. In 1915, he was elected a bencher of King's Inns. Later, in 1929, he would become an Irish High Court judge and serve in that capacity until 1943. He was also involved in one of the dad's armies of the day, the Irish Rugby Football Union Volunteer Corps, which drilled and did weapons training for home defense purposes. Their uniforms bore the legend George Rex, so they were nicknamed the Gorgeous Rex. Uh, Hannah actually lived on Lansdowne Road, number 54 Lansdowne Road, near the railway level crossing. He is recorded in the ILT as giving numerous lectures and talks on the subject of Gallipoli and related matters. In one such lecture, he observed of the 10th Division that, although the military history of their efforts at Suvla Bay may never be written, it was the duty of the people of Dublin to see that their memory was never forgotten. Appropriate, therefore, if a little ironic, that he should do so himself. He made it his business to talk to many veterans of the ill-advised campaign. He chose to fasten on the particularly poignant story of D Company of the 7th Battalion of the RDF, the pals, the rugby players, the toughs in the toughs, as they were known, the toughs being the nickname of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, actually the nickname of the second Royal Dublin Fusiliers, but we let that one pass. In 1917, he published an account of the travails of this unit in the pals at Suvla Bay an unhappy experience exacerbated by the decision of their divisional commander, General Sir Brian Mahon, to resign at a crucial point in the campaign when the 7th RDF was trying to hold gains that had been made on the 15th of August 1915 at Kirich Tepe Sert Ridge and was being slaughtered by Turkish grenades in the process. Mahon chose this moment to protest at the failure of the operational commander, the hapless General Sir Ian Hamilton, to promote him. So he basically threw a hissy fit. The Pals at Suvla was originally released in a limited edition of 200 copies, lavishly illustrated by an artist, Lieutenant G. Drummond Fish, sent specifically to paint the Suvla landscape by the army in a series of vivid watercolors. There's an example of one of them there. The proceeds of the sale of the book were in aid of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers Prisoner of War and Comforts Fund. The only discordant note, at least as far as I'm concerned, was that the foreword was written by General Sir Brian Mahon, whose uh, hissy fit and withdrawal from Suvla Bay to a distant island had, as far as I'm concerned, contributed generously to the losses incurred by D Company on Kirich Tepe Cert. After printing and production expenses were deducted, the project raised £100 for the Royal Dublin Fusiliers Fund. But from a purely business point of view, things were actually looking up for the legal profession by 1915. Hurrah! In October 1914, the Irish Law Times had drawn attention to the decline in incomes over the preceding two years. But the six months since the outset of the conflict had, it would seem, been good for the Irish Bar in particular. On the 3rd of April 1915, the journal observed cheerily that... We are glad to note that the somewhat gloomy forebodings at the beginning of the Hillary sittings as to the volume of business were falsified by the facts. The crisis through which the country is passing by reason of the war certainly curtailed the volume of work, but taking everything into consideration, the term just ended was satisfactory. The prospects for next term are not at all discouraging. This must, in part, have been owing to the exodus of many talented younger members of the profession, and uh, one or two who were actually quite long in the tooth to take up junior commissions in the army. As they might have said in the courts of law, 
malum quidem nullum esse sine aliquo bono, which is a technical legal term that I've just made up, which roughly translates as every cloud has a silver lining. Not as snappy as mater semper certa est, but it'll, it'll do for now. One growth area, as far as the law was concerned, was defending enemy aliens, generally German, Austrian, or Hungarian, against detention orders or other newly acquired legal disabilities. Under the terms of the Alien Restrictions Act, the Irish Law Times reported on the prosecution of Alfred Heyman in June of 1917. He was a waiter in the famous uh, Jamet's restaurant, or Jamet's restaurant, depending on how posh you were, and he'd given false information when registering in Rathmines police station in October 1914. He claimed to be Russian. Heyman is an unlikely Russian name, I think you'll agree. Uh, he gave himself up to the uh, Dublin Metropolitan Police on the 23rd of May 1917, and his counsel told the police court that... The matter got on his nerves, and he was afraid that he would be arrested. Now, his honesty did him very little good when it came to sentencing because he got three months' hard labor. A curious aspect of the act was the Australian Restrictions Change of Name Order of October 1914. This prohibited the use of any name other than that by which one was ordinarily known at the date of the commencement of the war. Now, obviously, the, the butcher in this punch cartoon of August 1914 got in just before the portcullis descended. According to the ILT, there was, under UK law at the time, and this came as a surprise to me, no restriction against a person changing their name. Uh, and this, the ILT pointed out, not infrequently facilitates fraud and crime. One wonders where this particular piece of legislation left those well-known British aristocratic families, the Battenbergs and the saxe coburg Gothas both of whom appear to have flouted this particular regulation by taking on the names of Mountbatten and Windsor a little bit later in the conflict. Uh, there was at least one fascinating case involving an alien reported on by the ILT in November 1914, so fairly early on in the war, which involved, it would appear, the Rotunda Hospital trying to pull a fast one. This was the case of Volkel versus the governors of the Rotunda Hospital. It prompted a significant decision as to the rights of enemy aliens. It was a personal injury case. It had been ready for trial before the war actually began. And the Rotunda, however, made the case that uh, Mrs. Volkel, who was the plaintiff, was now an enemy alien with no right to sue through the Irish courts under the terms of the Alien Restrictions Act. And the case came before Justices Gibson and Dodd in the King's Bench Division. The plaintiff, however, who happened to be the British-born wife of an Austrian who was resident in Ireland, was a registered alien with a permit to live in a prohibited area. And the court held that she was entitled to the benefit of the King's peace as she was registered and licensed and being allowed to continue to reside in this country. So, one in the eye for the Rotunda Hospital, though I suppose they can hardly be blamed for trying it on. Um, perhaps the best known woman in the UK during the Great War was not the Queen or Margot Asquith or even Emmeline Pankhurst, but uh, the aforementioned Dora. She only weighed only a few paragraphs at birth. But uh, by the age of four, she had, as I said, swelled to gargantuan proportions. The ubiquitous defense of the Realm Act was a constant factor in the professional lives of barristers and solicitors from 1914 to 1919. There was no escape from Dora, whether you were a publican being closed down for serving drink to soldiers, a shopkeeper fined five pounds for refusing to sell sugar without tea, a baker fined for not selling bread by weight, a milk vendor jailed for a month for adding 4% water to his product, or a publican fined two pounds for displaying a Sinn Féin flag on his premises, or a farmer fined for not cultivating enough of his land. All of the above and many similar cases are reported on in the ILT. The latter case, the farmer I mentioned, uh, involved one James Nesbitt, who came before Monaghan Petty Sessions. 
He farmed 40 acres and in 1917 was adjudged by the Department of Agriculture officials that he did not have enough of his land under the plough. This too was the subject of Adora regulation. During the Great War, Ireland went from 9% tillage to about 40% uh, tillage as a consequence of legislation. Um, Nesbitt's land was seized uh, by the Department of Agriculture and auctioned. And I think in an interesting throwback to the days of the Land League, no one came forward to bid on his farm. And his solicitor told the magistrates that Nesbitt had acted in ignorance of the law, which I thought wasn't a defense, but there you go. And, but he was now being a good boy, and he was cultivating 20% of his holding. So a small fine was imposed. Mind you, there's always a chancer in the undergrowth somewhere. And in a short piece in November 1918, the ILT drew attention to a farmer who went to the other extreme and sought to take advantage of the cultivation regulations of the Defense of the Realm Act. What he did was he plowed his fields so enthusiastically that in the process, he just happened to tear up two paths that delineated rights of way across his land. Uh, Dora, however, got her revenge for this grave contravention of the spirit of the law, and he was convicted of willfully destroying the footpaths, and he was ordered to reinstate them. As the war progressed, there was an obsession with food production and concerns about food supply. New orders were being made on a regular basis on price, quality, quantity, and distribution. Every facet of food production. Judges were expected to enforce these regulations rigorously. And in January 1918, the ILT observed that the lay press has recently reported many cases in which the fines were entirely too small. Now, it's very encouraging to see that the highly offensive journalistic practice of criticizing judicial condition, uh, decisions has now entirely ceased. However, one profession apparently not governed by Dora was that of the fortune teller. It was one of the consequences of the mass slaughter of the Great War that grieving wives and parents were resorting in desperation to all sorts of occult charlatans. Seances were very much in vogue. As for survivors, people who were going back to the front, was fortune telling. The ILT in September 1917 drew attention to a piece carried by that colorful and racy journal, I'm sure you'll agree, The Justice of the Peace. Altogether, the troubled waters created by the war have favored the operations of those who dangle the dazzling bait of magic before the less wary fish of the human shoal. Thus had the Justice of the Peace editorialized. Prosecutions, it noted, were taking place under Section 4 of the Vagrancy Act 1824 for pretending or professing to tell fortunes. The only alternative, apparently, was prosecution under Section 4 of the Witchcraft Act of 1735 for undertaking to tell fortunes, though this uh, had not apparently been used since 1904. The penalties, fortunately, included up to a year in jail as opposed to immolation at the stake. However, the Justice of the Peace went on to opine that, but no infliction of penalties <coughs> upon the impostors will stop them in their lucrative frauds or eradicate in their dupes a belief in the occult. What the severities of the early Christian emperors and the cruelties of the Spanish Inquisition failed to do is not likely to be affected by our mild punishments. Mild punishments. This may or may not have been a veiled plea for a return to use of the thumbscrew and the rack. Now, despite its native stuffiness, the Irish Law Times had some semblance of a sense of humor, albeit usually bone dry. These cartoons, by the way, are not from the Irish Law Times. They're merely designed to distract you while we tell some really dreadful jokes. Now, an exception to the humor-free zone was in the early months of the war, when in a fit of giddiness, the Irish Law Times used its weekly law notes column to subject its readers to some of what I think you will agree are the direst legal jokes ever recounted. For example, to what class of property does a zeppelin belong? It is an heirloom because it looms in the air. What is meant by restraint on anticipation? The inability of the Kaiser to conquer Europe. Mm -hmm. Give an instance of a secret trust. 
a German spy. Utterly hilarious, I'm sure you'll agree. Now, occasionally the uh, ILT sought to tap into some zeitgeist or other, but it, it was about as successful as I would venture to suggest a distinguished judge making pithy comments from the bench on the latest episode of The Voice of Ireland. For example, this piece called from the weekly notes and queries column in January 1916 on Americanisms that, according to the well-informed Irish Law Times, are sure in their time to come into the permanency of the dictionary and to be generally accepted as additions to the language. Okay, so what the Irish Law Times were anticipating would come into the language on this side of the Atlantic included such apparently deathless neologisms as compulsiency, a necessity or compulsion, duberous, doubtful, lowerarchy, the rule of the lower classes, dog robber, I love this one, a menial army servant, and finally, Armstrong, something handmade as opposed to manufactured by machine. Now, only the latter expression, Armstrong, has stuck, and even it has evolved to mean a chemically rather than naturally induced proficiency in the sport of cycling. Now, the ILT was also convinced that certain phrases, which they were reliably informed, were in widespread use in the USA, wouldn't these are phrases, not words, would migrate to the UK and survive the crossing and that they would, they would thrive in the vernacular. Phrases such as sound on the goose, meaning reliable, or dead in the shell, meaning worn out, or fine head, which meant apparently fastidious. Now, I suggest that one of the learned senior counsel here tonight might try the following on a judge. I am sorry, your lordship is dead in the shell. You may be dubious, but my witness is sound on the goose despite a capuciency to be excessively fine-haired. And I su suggest then waiting for the reaction, which might be something like that. One of the things that uh, comes across from reading the regular references to war casualties in the Irish Law Times is the number of judges who had sons and some daughters involved in the conflict and obviously at great risk. So it should therefore not be too surprising that many members of the judiciary put considerable energy into military recruitment in Ireland. Others, while not actively involved in the enlistment campaign, made their own adjunct contributions. One of the most active members of the judiciary in this regard was the Irish Lord Chancellor himself, Sir Ignatius O'Brien. Others, like Justices Barton and Dodd, spoke at recruitment meetings, actually spoke at recruitment meetings. In July 1915, the Irish Law Times noted in an editorial piece that the judges of Assizes have shown a keen interest in the progress of recruiting in the various counties of Ireland and have delivered strong appeals to farmers' sons and others to join the new army. They have also urged the grand juries to exercise their influence in the promotion of recruiting. On occasions, judges were not above using their position on the bench to assist the army in the numbers game. For example, in December 1914, the ILT reported that at Leinster Winter Assizes, Thomas Shields, a lance corporal in the 9th Inniskilling Fusiliers, had pleaded guilty to wounding John Byrne on the 4th of August. Captain D.M. Wilson of the Inniskillings gave Shields a good character, describing in the witness box as a very useful soldier. The presiding judge, Justice Kenny, ruled that, as the accused was a very useful soldier at the present national crisis, he would allow him to stand out in his own recognizance. Presumably, John Byrne was not too pleased with this outcome, but as he was a civilian who had still not enlisted by the end of 1914, satisfying Mr. Byrne presumably did not enter into Justice Kenny's calculations. An even more revealing case was heard in February 1917 at the Oma Crown Sessions by Judge Linehan. Uh, Montgomery Weir of Fintona was found guilty of housebreaking and larceny. He's quoted by the ILT as having said in reply to Judge Linehan that he would enlist if given the opportunity. He was medically examined and having passed as fit for service was handed over to a military escort. Now, as there was a military escort 
and a medical examiner on hand in or adjacent to the courtroom, this, you have to assume, was probably a regular occurrence. Judge Linehan was essentially acting as a recruiting sergeant. As it happens, Weir survived the war. Despite the war raging in Europe, the bar, both in Britain and in Ireland, managed to cling to much of its ancient and to, uh, to lay people often opaque and enigmatic custom and practice. In October 1918, the ILT noted that Judge Wakeley was presented with white gloves at an assizes session, there being no criminal business for disposal. And this also appears to have been a custom of the time. You'll pardon me if I was completely unaware of that fact. Of equal significance, though, as far as I'm concerned, is the fact that no criminal defendants came before a judge. The previous January, the same Judge Wakeley, by the way, had referred in court to a letter he had received from a woman about a probate case he was adjudicating. The letter contained a five-pound note. He announced that he did not propose to take any further action, although this was a clear case of attempted bribery. Uh, so punctilious, though, was his lordship that he asked an RIC sergeant to return the money to the lady and get a receipt. Uh, two items for inclusion in what I would categorize as the some things never change even in wartime department. For, from April 1915, the ILT informed us that His Honor Judge Drummond, having refused to sit in Ballymahan Courthouse, which he described as a leftover cow house, Mr. Delaney, Crown Solicitor, at the meeting of the Board of Guardians on Tuesday, applied for the use of the workhouse boardroom in which to hold the April quarter sessions. So even in 1914, judges were wont to complain about their working environments. And then there was this gem from June 1916, quoted by the ILT, in this instance from the British Law Journal. Sometimes I ride in tramway cars because I think it is the duty of a judge to keep himself acquainted with all phases of human life and affairs, said Mr. Justice Avery in the court of a case tried before him recently. Good for him. Today, of course, no judge need struggle to acquaint him or herself with popular culture or the pursuits of the hoi polloi. I'm sure we'll agree. Our judges today are no longer the remote, aloof, cosseted demigods of old. They are of the people. And if perish the thought, they're caught off guard by a reference to Nidge or the X Factor in their courtrooms, they can always surreptitiously Google them on their smartphones. Now, uh, staying in the area of custom and practice before I finish this section, I hesitate to draw your attention to this particular item, but in October 1916, the ILT reported that new rules had been drawn up shortening legal holidays and adding 20 working days to the legal year. The piece, however, doesn't say, fortunately, for how long the new onerous legal year actually extended. Uh, my apologies for bringing that to your attention. Through the entire period of the Great War, despite the growing crisis, as well as labor shortages and paper shortages, the Irish Law Times never missed a publication deadline or failed to appear, except once. There was no Irish Law Times on the 29th of April, 1916. In its edition of the 6th of May, the ILT explained that, the publication of this journal on the 29th instant was prevented by circumstances connected with the deplorable rising in Dublin, known as the Sinn Féin Rebellion. The unprecedented events of the week, beginning on Easter Monday, will be a lifelong memory to all persons living in Dublin or having business connections therewith. As the four courts had been, uh, as the ILT said itself, in the hands of the Sinn Féiners, there had been considerable damage to the fabric of the building, but the ILT told its readers triumphantly that the courts would be back in action in a couple of days. The journal also drew attention to the destruction of the offices of a number of solicitors, especially those in the vicinity of Sackville Street, and said that solicitors affected would be assisted by other members of their profession. Cursory attention, it has to be said, was paid in the newspaper or in the journal to the executions of 1916, and uh, the ILT assured its readers that no one had been shot without trial. Technically correct if a drumhead court-martial equates with proceedings in a court of law. Other than that, it was straight back to business. Condemnation of the rising there was, but it has to be said, nothing too rancorous. Of greater interest to the ILT was the legal question of who pays for the damage. Are 
the ratepayers liable. Does this means apply when the damage is caused by His Majesty's forces quelling an insurrection? It may be difficult, if not impossible, to determine, in most cases, how the destruction came about. What are the liabilities of insurance companies in the circumstances that have arisen? Good to see they had their priorities right. It wasn't until the addition of the 10th of May that the ILT focused on the court's martial, noting in an example of what I would describe as extreme understatement that they evoke widespread interest. Um, attention then switched to the impending trial of Sir Roger Casement in London. He's described by the ILT in a June editorial as an arch offender, which seems to fly in the face of notions of innocence until guilt is proven. The following month, the ILT, in its coverage of uh, uh, the trial of a German spy, Anton Kupferl, in London, quoted the English Lord Chief Justice in his praise of defense counsel for taking the Kupferl brief. It is in accordance with the honorable traditions of the bar that even a charge so odious as that of spying in the interests of the enemy should meet with a proper defense. Now the ILT goes on to then quote the Law Journal in its congratulations of the Lord Chief Justice for those remarks. Not merely because members of the bar must now frequently be engaged in the defense of persons who are found to be enemies of their country, but also because an attempt has recently been made to revive the mischievous fallacy that an advocate ought to be satisfied that his client is in the right before he undertakes to represent him in court. One is moved on reading such laudable sentiments to wonder why the ILT didn't then proceed to use this opportunity to draw attention to the fact that London solicitor George Gavin Duffy had by this time been constructively dismissed from the law firm in which he worked for having agreed to take on the defense of Roger Casement. Ironically, the ILT then proceeds to pull on the green jersey in its coverage of Casement's trial, where he was prosecuted by the Attorney General himself, F.E. Smith, and defended by Irish barrister Sergeant Sullivan, because no British attorney exclusively associated with the English bar could be found to defend him. Sullivan had dual membership of the Irish and the English bars. The ILT can barely conceal its excitement at the fact that an Irish-based barrister has agreed to take a, a case in the High Court in London, a rare event. And when it does take place, the conduct of the case is watched by Irish lawyers with close attention. Sergeant Sullivan's defense of Sir Roger Casement is expected to be a brilliant one from the legal standpoint and to be worthy of the high tradition of the Irish bar. Uh, a Michael Mansfield he may well have been, but Sullivan's arguments were to no avail, and uh, Casement, as you know, all well know, went to the gallows on the 3rd of August, 1916. One of the few positives to emerge from the Great War was peaceful social upheaval. The bulk of the men called upon to actually fight the war had not had an opportunity to vote for or against the aristocratic and bourgeois politicians who had sent them to the front in the first place. That could not be allowed to happen again. Similarly, with the women who had often replaced those men in the factories and the fields. The extension of the franchise was the very least that the establishment could offer as a reward. Of course, amid fears that women might actually outnumber men at the polls and might make silly feminine decisions like having a pussycat elected as prime minister or something like that, the franchise was restricted to women above the age of 30. Um, the legal profession, I love this cartoon by the way, the legal profession was not immune. I'm not sure if you can read. What's the disturbance in the market? It's a mass meeting of women who've changed their minds since the morning and want to, uh, to alter their voting papers. That's, that's Punch, that's what Punch thought about women getting the vote in December 1918. Now, the legal profession was not immune from these social pressures, though it would take another couple of years to succumb to the demands of suffragists. Uh, Stanley Buckmaster had been Liberal Lord Chancellor from 1914 to 1916. He had vacated the position when Asquith was given the heave-ho in December 1916 and replaced by a coalition government led by Lord George. In March 1917, by now Viscount Buckmaster, he introduced a measure into the House of Lords that would force the admission of women into the solicitor's profession. On the 3rd of March, ILT quoted the law journal, the English law journal, as calling the move untimely. 
the law journal invoked war loyalty when it opined that it would be surprised if the House of Lords does not adopt the view that it would be unbecoming to make many fun fundamental changes in the membership of either branch of the legal profession while all its younger members are fighting in their country's cause. Coincidentally, barely two months later, Ireland became embroiled in a gender-based legal contretemps when an Irish court decided that a woman was not eligible to hold the post of Clerk of Petty Sessions. Georgina Frost had discharged such duties after her father, Thomas Frost, uh, the Six Mile Bridge County Clare Petty Sessions clerk, became ill and he retired in 1915. Now, she had already been assisting her father for a number of years. She was perfectly qualified and she was duly appointed to the post in her own right by the local resident magistrates. The Lord Lieutenant, however, refused to sanction the appointment on the grounds that she was disqualified from being appointed by virtue of her sex. The redoubtable Georgina Frost challenged this ruling in the High Court with uh, Timothy Healy as her KC. Justice Barton in the Chancery Court in April 1917 sided with the Crown in the case, which argued that Miss Frost, as a woman, was far too delicately nurtured for the task as it might become her duty to take depositions in criminal cases which would be unpleasant for her and for everybody concerned. Perish the thought. Justice Barton agreed with the Crown's proposition. The ban, he insisted, was not based on any deficit in the abilities of Miss Frost, who was clearly a thoroughly competent and experienced woman. But upon considerations of decorum and upon the unfitness of certain painful and exacting duties in relation to the finer qualities of women. Were I to mutter that awful four-word phrase, Chief Justice Susan Denham, in the vicinity of his recumbent remains, I have no doubt Justice Barton would begin to spin vigorously in his grave. A footnote, re Justice Barton, I'm reliably informed that he gave his name to the annual trophy fought out on a national basis between the various Irish constituent golf clubs of the Golfing Union of Ireland, the Barton Cup. Golf and feminism have never been renowned as compatible bedfellows, I would have said. Uh, anyway, Georgina Frost lost an application to the Court of Appeal, but she took her case all the way to the House of Lords and was duly appointed Petty Sessions Clerk for Six Mile Bridge, a post she retained until her own retirement at the behest of the Irish Free State Government in 1922. But all that was in the future in 1917, and there was concerted opposition to the notion of female solicitors or, reels back in absolute horror, female barristers. There were some liberal voices raised. Judge Perry, for example, who sat on the English bench in the fortnightly review, was pointed in his support for Buckmaster's bill. And he is quoted uh, in the Irish Law Times to the effect that, the only possible objection to women joining the ranks of the bar or the solicitors is the selfish animal trade union fear that there is only so much soup to go round and that any further competition would result in hunger and possible starvation among existing members. The Law Journal, again quoted in the Irish Law Times, heaped scorn on Parry's assessment, asserting that chivalrous male barristers would be at a disadvantage if faced with female opponents as they would feel obliged to hold back. There are certain classes of cases in the divorce and criminal courts which no advocate could conduct with freedom if his opponent belonged to the other sex. Judges and juries, as well as counsel and solicitors, would be hampered by their presence and the interests of justice would inevitably suffer by reason of his unwanted feeling of restraint. The Sex Disqualification Removal Act passed in 1919 finally enabled women to enter the legal profession, the civil service, and to become jurors. Francis Kyle, that's um, uh, uh, Georgina Frost, by the way. Francis Kyle was the first Irish woman called to the bar in November 1921. She took her first, took first place in the bar examinations that year. And the first woman to practice at the bar was Averill Deverell, who was called the bar on the same day as Kyle. And this was some months prior to Ivy Williams becoming the first woman to be called to the English bar in 1922. 
In conclusion, the Irish Law Times, like many similar professional publications at the time, was factional, stuffy, opinionated, curmudgeonly, and conservative. It was a publication entirely devoid of self-doubt, catering to a profession that, like the ILT itself, combined flamboyance with prolixity and flowery rhetoric with painstaking exactitude. By 21st century standards, it lacked much redemptive enlightenment, but because of the nature of the occupation and the scope of the association of its professional readership, it offered a wonderfully, as far as I'm concerned, panoramic view of Irish society in the early 1900s and could occasionally be utterly delightful and one suspect have its tongue firmly embedded in its cheek. It could be aroused to paeons of righteous anger the invective leveled against Germany, for example, for the sinking of the RMS Leinster in October 1918 was of a far higher pitch than any anti-Sinn Féin rhetoric of 1916. The ILT describing what is still the worst maritime disaster to have taken place in the Irish Sea as one of the blackest crimes even Germany has been guilty of in the hideous nightmare called the war. And when righteous anger might have been expected, the ILT instead could be coolly pragmatic and legalistic, as in its expression that demands for the extradition of the Kaiser from the Netherlands would be ineffectual, as his alleged crimes were likely to be seen in Dutch courts as a breach of international usage between belligerents rather than a breach of any municipal law. To finish on a lighter note, the ILT, for which I, I've developed a surprising amount of affection in our mutual association going back about six months now, was also the, the master of the surprise segue, either delighting in the most inappropriate juxtapositions or simply not caring about obvious non sequiturs. In one particularly delicious example uh, with which I will conclude, in November 1915, it switched from the deadly to the utterly banal in successive paragraphs. First, it carried the story of the commutation of the death sentence on one Jane Reynolds, who had been convicted of the murder of Mrs. Rosa Di Lucia in Sligo on the 8th of December, 1913. Her husband, Angelo Di Lucia, the ILT informed its readers, is at present under sentence of death. Now, Rather than elaborating on the nature of the crime passionnel obviously involved here, the journal leaves us in suspense to move on to more pressing matters, which concerns a novel legal point raised in some sheep-dipping cases heard at the last Louth Petty Sessions in Drogheda. Here at least we are not left hanging. The pun is entirely intentional. Farmers, it appears, in County Down had been brought before the beak for not having their dipping certificates up to date. Their defense solicitor, Jesuitically but ingeniously, tried to claim that Louth Petty Sessions had no jurisdiction in the matter whatever as the counties didn't adjoin because of the presence of that large stretch of water, Carlingford Lock. The magistrate uh, dismissed the maneuver and said the court did actually have jurisdiction. So despite its bluster, its occasional bombast, and its self-importance, how can one fail to warm to a periodical that juxtaposes adulterous homicide with agricultural fungicide? Madam Chief Justice, former Chief Justice, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Irish Law Times, 1914 to 1919. Thank you.